Hello and welcome to this video about supporting your teenager with lockdown challenges and returning to school. Today we're going to be talking about development during adolescence, the impact of lockdown on teenagers and how parents can help and support their young people. Lockdown is likely to have been particularly challenging for teenagers due to their developmental stage. They're in transition, they're not children and they're not yet adults. So it's a time of change in development, both physically and emotionally. And adolescents face a con conflict between a desire for independence, but also still needing their parents, both emotionally and practically. And lockdown has meant that opportunities for freedom and independence have been impacted. Teenagers are undergoing a lot of physical and hormonal changes, possibly feeling pressure to fit in with peers, with school friends, but also to be an individual. And those peer relationships have become increasingly more important to them. They're also preparing for and thinking about next steps, such as going into work or to college, perhaps to university, and the stress that the increased workload and the pressure of examinations can bring. They're very difficult changes for adolescents to go through anyway, but once we add on top the concerns and the changes that they have to manage from the pandemic and lockdown, there are many young people who may be having a particularly difficult time at the moment. Between childhood and adulthood, our hormones kickstart a phase of significant change. And while the physical changes of adolescence may be obvious, less visible are changes that these hormones trigger in our brains, which might just be responsible for turning our teenage years into a roller coaster. Throughout our lives, our brains undergo a process called neural pruning. The synapses through which our neurons communicate are either lost or strengthened, depending on how much we use them. Well-used synapses grow strong, while the weaker ones fade away. It's this process that makes us capable of faster, clearer and more complex thought as we grow up. But crucially, pruning happens at different rates in different areas of the brain. By the time we're adolescents, the neural networks that communicate emotion, risk and reward are well developed, while others, which may help us to plan, prioritise, think logically and moderate our social behaviour, are yet to mature. So, a potential mismatch between our emotion and our judgment arises just as our emotional and social worlds are becoming more complex, making an increase in social anxiety quite normal at this time. The development of the adolescent brain will also have an impact on how teenagers are responding to this new situation. Without a fully developed frontal lobe, adolescents process their emotions differently to adults. So even though they may talk or sound like adults, they're unable to process their emotions in the same way that adults can. And this affects areas such as reasoning. Teenagers can struggle to fully process cause and effect and not necessarily have a reason for what they've done or understanding why they're in trouble. Logical thinking. Teenagers often base their decisions or reactions on how they're feeling at that current time. Planning and impulse control. We often see teenagers display impulsive behaviours which can increase their risk taking. Problem solving. As we see teenagers react on impulse, they often focus on the here and now short term goals rather than at any longer term negative consequences which may occur due to their actions. Decision making. Teenagers can often misinterpret information. Processing of emotions. We then see poor processing of emotions, which can lead to stronger reactions to stress and more displays of frustration and aggression. So as we can see, the teenage brain is still developing well into their early 20s, resulting in some teenagers really struggling to regulate their emotions with decision making, with impulse control and logical thinking. It doesn't mean that they can't do these things, but that they will find it harder than adults. This slide shows some of the common feelings and experiences young people are currently going through. 
having considered where teenagers are in their development and also that they've missed out on lots of experiences that they were due to have, such as end of school activities and sitting exams they've been working towards, all of these feelings are completely understandable. In particular, there will have been big changes to young people's routine. They may be more likely to be feeling low and worried and together it's very likely that this will have affected how much sleep they are getting. It's important to remember that all of these feelings are very common among teenagers right now. It may be helpful to think about whether you've noticed any of these in your own children and also whether you've noticed any of these feelings in yourself as a response to lockdown. So now we're going to talk about what you as parents can do and we're going to be talking about these different techniques which you can use in response to some of the difficult feelings your teenager may be facing. What, it, what is really important to support your children in managing their emotions is communication. A key skill for you to use when talking about emotions is called validation. Validation involves recognising and accepting emotions. It communicates clearly to another that their feelings and thoughts make sense and that they're understandable. It allows parents to let their children know that they get it, even if they disagree with their actions. When talking about thoughts and feelings, try to remember not to judge, criticise, ridicule, ignore, lecture or dismiss your teenager. It sounds simple, but it's easy to forget this. And sometimes our instinct is to say, get on with it. It could be worse. Why are you being so dramatic? Or we may say, don't be silly. Why are you getting so upset? This can make teenagers feel that they haven't been understood and that they're not being listened to. And this can then make it harder for your teenager to accept help from you. The main concept of validation is to really listen to what is being expressed and can be and be completely present. So not to be distracted or half in the conversation with your teenager, allowing them to express their feelings and acknowledge what they're saying. And then summarizing what you think they're feeling shows that you're taking how they're feeling seriously and that their emotions and behaviors are valid. Even if you don't understand why they feel the way they do, because sometimes it can be really difficult to understand another perspective. It's still important to acknowledge the feelings and that they matter. Some examples are shown on the slide and include things like I can see you're really upset about that or I understand it can be really scary trying new things. So there has been a lack of motivation and a routine in a lot of teenagers during lockdown. They've been experiencing a loss of routine, their sleep may be disturbed, and these can also these things can lead teenagers to do less, which can lead them to feeling down. So keeping all of those common feelings and behaviours in mind from what, the last slide, here we will show you how the things we do and the way that we feel are linked to create a cycle which you can see on the left in the red. We know that there's a link between the things that we do and the way we feel. In lockdown, adults and teenagers may have found their normal routine has been turned upside down and that they haven't been able to do the things that normally would bring them enjoyment in their life. When people are doing less of the activities that they enjoy or they're not able to see their friends, they get less of the feel good factor and their mood may start to drop. As a person's mood drops, their energy levels and motivation also drop. This then leads them to withdrawing even more from the activities or socialising that they normally do. And of course, this will further contribute to their mood dropping and negative feelings becoming stronger. As you can see, this creates a cycle that can feel difficult to break out of. We know that during lockdown, this has been particularly difficult because it's been harder than usual for people to find routine and to do the things that normally make them feel good. However, there are ways that you as parents can help your teenagers to start, break out of this, start breaking out of this cycle by helping them to find activities that matter to them or that they enjoy. And from there, helping them plan how to incorporate these activities into their life so that they can start to rebuild a routine. So how you can help as a parent or a carer 
The most important thing that you can do is to support your young person in building a routine. Having a good routine will not only prepare them for that transition back into that school timetable, it can also be a good way of incorporating activities into their lives that are meaningful and enjoyable. As we talked about in the last slide, if young people are doing things that bring them a sense of achievement or enjoyment, that will then impact their mood by making them feel more positive and will also help them to increase their levels of motivation and energy. If they feel more motivated, they are then more likely to do activities. It's important, however, to keep in mind how they might be feeling right now. And for some young people, they won't be able to jump straight into a consistent routine. Keep in mind the importance of emotional validation and make sure you've spent some time talking and listening to your teenager before you try to suggest a new routine. We have to be prepared to take small steps to begin with, and we know that it can be difficult to get a teen to start doing activities again. So make sure to keep this collaborative and find something that your child would like to do. We know from working with a lot of young people with a low mood that they can be active but still feel low. This tends to happen when the young person is doing lots of activities that do not feel important or if they feel pushed to do things by others or they're focusing just on one area of their lives. Therefore, some of the important areas of their lives aren't getting much attention. If you notice this happening, it may be helpful to encourage your child to have a balance of valued activities across different life areas, including the things that matter and people that matter to them, as well as something that they can do just for themselves. And it's very important they try to act according to their plan, not according to their mood. Another common way that lockdown has affected teenagers is that their sleep routines in many cases have become disrupted. This is completely understandable given the fact that so many people have completely lost the normal structure of their day. And first I'd like to draw your attention to this table. Due to their developmental stage, teenagers need significantly more sleep than adults do. So if they're between the age of about 12 to 13, they would need 9 to 11 hours, and a teen would need typically 8 to 10 hours. Compared to an adult who only needs 7 to 9, that is quite a significant difference. So it's important to keep in mind and to make sure that your child has every opportunity to get all of the sleep that they need. These are some tips for improving your child's sleep routine. If their day to night cycle has completely switched and they're staying awake until the early hours of the morning and then not getting up until the afternoon, it will be important to support them in making the change back to their normal sleep routine before they return to school. The best way of doing this is not to try to get them to sleep earlier, but instead to wake them up earlier. This is because if someone tries to start going to bed earlier than they usually would, they are likely to not feel tired at all. And we can't force our bodies to sleep. Instead, if we wake ourselves up earlier, we are more likely to be tired by the time it comes to going to bed. No napping goes hand in hand with this. It is really important to encourage your child not to nap during the day, as again, this will make it much harder for them to get to sleep in the evening. We recommend that for anyone who's struggling to improve their sleep routine, it's really important to only use your bed for sleeping. This is because your brain needs to learn to associate your bed with sleeping and not with being on your phone, watching TV or doing homework. If your child spends a lot of time awake in bed, work with them to try to find a different space where they feel comfortable to do those activities when they're awake to ensure that they're only getting into bed when it's time to go to sleep. Again, this is something you'll need to do collaboratively with your child in order for it to be successful and for your child to want to make this change. If your child is really struggling with their sleep routine, then certain areas of the child wellbeing team are offering 
three session programmes on a one to one basis to support your child in making improvements to their sleep routine. If this is something you think would be helpful, get in touch with us and we will give you more information on this intervention. It's an uncertain time in the world right now and understandable that children, teenagers and adults may be feeling anxious. Key characteristics of situations that create worry and anxiety are a heightened sense of uncertainty, potential threat and responsibility and a reduced sense of control. So it is easy to see why our current circumstances are fueling anxiety. We often characterise anxiety as overestimating the chance of danger while simultaneously underestimating our ability to cope with that danger. Being in lockdown means that teenagers won't have had to face situations that they may have found anxiety provoking in the past. Or because they haven't done certain things, they now feel anxious about them. For example, seeing friends, being in big groups, trying new things and going to school. This may have led to a reduction in anxiety at first, but as they face relaxing of lockdown and anxiety, therefore other anxieties might start to increase. Anxiety is made up of three components, anxious thinking, anxious behaviour and the physical sensations in the body. These work together to make maintain anxiety. When we feel anxious, we overestimate the chance of bad things happening and underestimate our ability to cope. Our anxious thoughts lead us to experience physical feelings of anxiety. These feelings are due to the fight, flight or freeze response, our body's inbuilt mechanism to help protect us from danger by either fighting it, running away or remaining undetected from threat. These uncomfortable thoughts and feelings act as evidence that the situation is dangerous and lead us to behave in ways to manage this. It is common that we want to avoid the situation we believe is causing us anxiety. In the example that you can see here, avoiding social gatherings or to ask for reassurance. Avoidance or seeking reassurance can be helpful at reducing anxiety in the short term. However, in the long term, it means we never learn that we would have been able to cope in a situation that we avoided or that we would have been able to cope without having that reassurance. So here we have some common thoughts that children might have had about the current situation. And it might be that some of these thoughts came up when you were thinking or you might recognise some of them as similar thoughts that you had. Parents might not may not have considered what their teenager would have been thinking during lockdown, and it might be helpful to consider this in order to validate them. So here are some understandable parent responses to children's anxiety. When we see that someone is feeling anxious, our tendency is to offer reassurance and to try and make them feel better. However, as we spoke about, reassurance can actually maintain anxiety in a number of ways. For example, it can, it can confirm a person's belief that there is actually something to worry about and the person may get to the stage where they can't try things out unless they've been told it's safe to do so. Also, we can want to protect them from the anxiety by saying they don't have to go or that they can stay home. And although these responses make complete sense as parents who want to protect their children, they can actually end up reinforcing the anxiety cycle. So here we have a few strategies that are useful whenever your child is in a heightened state of arousal. They can also be helpful if children are feeling really excited about something. So if you want to come back to this slide after the presentation or you want to pause it and just have a look at what to do. These exercises are really good for um, holding the tension and then releasing it in the body.
So now we're going to talk about helping to challenge anxious thoughts and thinking more realistically. And remember, the first thing to do when supporting your young person's anxiety is to validate their emotions and empathise with them. Instead of reassuring your teenager, one thing parents can do is to help them come up with a more balanced thought. When we feel anxious, we tend to think of the worst case scenario of what could, ha of, of what could happen, which is often unlikely. Alternatively, the best case scenario may also be as equally unlikely. You can help your young person come up with a more balanced or realistic thought, which is somewhere in between the two, by questioning them about how realistic their thought is. Rather than telling them a balanced thought that you might have come up with, help them by questioning them so that they come up, they come up with this thought independently. At first, it might feel like you're having to do this a lot, but we want this to eventually become a habit so when they come across a difficult situation they can respond independently with a balanced thought. They could pretend to be a, de a detective or a judge in court and you can ask questions like what's the evidence for that thought and why do they think that? Is there anything that could suggest that the thought might not be true? Then you can help your child to think about coping. You could ask how did you manage this when this happened before? Or how could you manage this if it does actually happen? You could also think of a plan for how to manage if it does actually happen. Or alternatively, you could help them by putting themselves in someone else's position and think about what advice they might give to a friend in their position. It's normal to reassure your child. However, if they rely on that, they're not able to reassure themselves when they're, when they're not around you and they cannot be independent. Thought challenging is a skill that you can teach your child to evaluate their worries without seeking reassurance. When a person naturally feels anxious, they will try to avoid the thing that they're worrying about. Because in the short term, if we don't have to do the thing that we're worried about, we will feel better. However, in the long term, this is going to keep the anxiety going because we haven't put ourselves in the situation to know that if we can cope. We know, for example, that a lot of young people have not been going outside. They haven't been seeing friends as much and they haven't had to try new things during lockdown. And because of that, many of them are feeling nervous about going back into those situations. For example, they might be nervous about going into shops, meeting up with big groups of people, going back to school or just generally going out again. It's important that you help your teen teenager to not avoid the thing that they're worrying about and encourage them to face their fears in small steps, as you can see with our ladder, a thermometer even on um, the slide. This way they can build up their confidence, learn that their fears are not accurate and that they can cope. It's important to make sure that these steps are small and are in line with current gov government guidelines during the pandemic. So as you can see, we've got small steps that are eventually going to lead up to going to walk into a shop alone and ordering something by themselves. So the first step would be to go for a walk with a trusted person so they're not going alone. And then the next step would be going for a walk alone to the shop when they're feeling comfortable to do so. And then they'd walk to the shop and go into the shop with the trusted person. And then the next step would be to walk to a shop and go in alone. And then they could walk into the shop and order something with the trusted person. And then the last step, when they're feeling confident enough, would be to walk into the shop alone and order something by themselves. Sometimes the things we're worried about are very realistic worries that very well could happen. For example, if a young person was nervous that they wouldn't be with their friends, in their new classes at school. In this situation, once you've eval emotionally validated the child, you can think about problem solving. This won't work necessarily for every teen. They may not be keen to do so, but you may be able to find a compromise. So firstly, you would define what the problem was and then list all of the possible solutions. Think of as many ways to solve the problem as possible, even if some initially felt silly. 
Then think of the pros and cons of each of the solutions you've come up with. How practical are they? How helpful are they? What would be the long and short term consequences? Is it actually feasible to do it? What could get in the way? Is there anybody that could help to do this? And then once this has been completed, rate each plan from zero to 10 in terms of how good you think it is. Choose one plan to try and set a time to do it. And then after that, review what happened. Did it work? If not, is there another option that you could try? It's really important to spend some time before you problem solve, just listening and empathizing with your young person. They will often feel frustrated or annoyed if a parent immediately asks lots of questions and tries to fix the issue before they feel that you fully understood it. So this should take place when you're both feeling calm and your child is engaged. Once you've spent some time listening to your team, you could suggest that you work together to solve some of the problems that they're worried about. Doing this in a collaborative way is most helpful with teenagers. Ask them to think together about how to manage the problem. For example, if they'd fallen behind with their work, you could work together to think about what might help with this problem. And it might be things such as making a timetable, speaking to a teenager to find out if there's extra support, um, going into their school and talking with their year leader. If your teenager refuses to see anybody or to exercise, only discuss this when you're both feeling calm. Try to understand the context, ask them and really listen to what they have to say. Ask them if they would like things to be different. Be very curious about what's getting in the way of them doing this. Show some empathy for their position and then you could try problem solving together and start with small steps. To summarise, when thinking about going back to school, it would really help to encourage your teenager to start getting back into their normal sleep routine. Listen to any worries that they may have and use some of the things discussed today to help them to manage this. If they're worried about falling behind in school, can you use problem solving to help them come up with a plan? If there are worries about seeing friends, could you gradually build up to this? And finally, we'd like to think a bit about managing your own anxiety. Our children are heavily influenced by how we act and what we do. So it's helpful for us to monitor our own emotions when supporting them with their worries. Once a decision is made, try not to be wobbly about it yourself. If you can show that you're confident that it will be OK and that your child will manage, then they will pick up on that. You may be more worried about the return to school than your child is. It's important to take a step back and look at how they're really doing separate from your concerns. Mm -hmm. And it's important to feel supported mm -hmm. yourself. So do share those concerns with trusted family or friends if you can and let the school know so that they can be aware that it's a difficult step for you and your child and offer you what support they can. If you would like further help and you live in southwest London, the Children and Young People's Wellbeing Service offers support to teenagers who are struggling with anxiety, low mood, lack of motivation and or sleep difficulties. And if you think your teenager would benefit from direct support, please speak to the mental health lead in your child's school to find out if there are education wellbeing practitioners who work in that school. If yes, they can support you to make a referral. We also have a book that we recommend here, Helping Your Child with Fears and Worries by Kathy Cresswell, which you can find at all major book outlets. If you have any further questions or concerns, the best place to start is at your child's school, as they are best placed to know how to get you the support that you need. We hope that this video has been helpful and we wish you all the best in supporting your child with their transition back to school.